on this edition of Arts and Minds. This is your brain on music. The network of regions that we already knew was the brain's reward and pleasure center. We didn't know that it would be activated in music. There is a sex, drugs, and rock and roll center of the brain, and there it is. Why Stanley Crouch hates hip hop. I think that there's a very deep harm in terms of the social thought about black people that comes directly out of rap video, just bragging about who they are and how much money they make, etc. I don't know if I'd want my kids around there. My parents have a grow up in their basement. Douglas Copeland goes green. You take a whole script, squish it down, and it only makes like without much. It's like spinach when you cook it, it just shrinks. And Sean Lennon deals with personal tragedy on Friendly Fire. Those stories on this edition of Arts and Minds. Daniel Levitin is a professor at McGill University in Montreal. He's a leading researcher in the field of music cognition and perception. On campus, Levitin's a popular teacher. In fact, his students treat him like a rock star. I hope you have an easy final and a good summer. It's the last day of class, and they're lining up for autographs. You're welcome. welcome. You know if it's teaching on semester? I am, but I don't know what yet. Levitin's book is called this is your brain on music. It's been widely praised as an accessible introduction to the science of music. We're in my laboratory now. This is uh, one of our testing rooms. This is our wall of fame. These are people that are our collaborators or colleagues, people who have visited the lab. Joni Mitchell visited, gave a little seminar. Here's Michael Brook. Michael's the inventor of the guitar called the infinite guitar that the edge plays in U2. And here's Susan Rogers. Susan's a doctoral student in the lab and former recording engineer for Prince. Yes. I just want your extra time and your kiss. Inside his office, you'll notice platinum records by the likes of Steely Dan and Stevie Wonder. Levinson worked for years as a musician, a recording engineer, and a record producer. He's had a subtle but significant influence on a number of hit records. A good example would be this guitar sound he created for Chris Isaac. I think one of the reasons I got into this research is that I wanted to understand more about the basis, the neural basis for what I learned in recording studios. So I, I approached this as somebody who had just a, a fantastic opportunity to learn about sound from the um, engineering and studio side, and now I want to understand it from the brain side. To get a look at a brain on music, Levitin agreed to take us to what he calls the Magnet, a functional MRI machine on the McGill campus. Bonjour. Bonjour. Bien. Oui. One of the things that's revolutionized the field of psychology and, and the stu scientific study of music is brain scanning technology. So for the last 20 years or so, we've been able to essentially take pictures of the brain at work. The way in which this actually works is that the hemoglobin of the blood is slightly magnetic and neurons need blood in order to metabolize, in order to do their work. The blood carries the oxygen and the oxygen is actually what they need. We're tracing the flow of blood throughout the brain. In an experiment like this, we'll have somebody go into an fMRI machine, which is a giant electromagnet, and we'll have them listen to music or think about music and we'll see where the oxygen is going in order to follow the trail of what the brain is doing. Over the course of many studies that we've done, we find a particular network of brain regions involved in music processing. Uh, they include in the frontal lobe, Broadman Area 47, a region I've been interested in for about 10 years now, because it seems to be responsible for the structure in both music and language. It's trying to predict what's going to come next. The a network of regions that we already knew was the brain's reward and pleasure center. The nucleus accumbens, ventral tegmental region, the hypothalamus, the, the amygdala. We knew they were involved in emotional processing for uh, when people would take drugs, when they would have orgasms, when they would win a large sum of money in a bet. We didn't know that it would be activated in music. And that was a, a real surprise. It was astonishing. I, there, there is a sex, drugs, and rock and roll center of the brain, and there it is. Levitin is also something of a comedian. Not really. 
He's written jokes for Arsenio Hall, Jay Leno, and the comic strip Bizarro. My favorite, you know, because of my musical background, is if Chuck Berry had played the tuba. So the idea is, right, these iconic shots of rock musicians are based on the idea that Chuck Berry played the guitar. But, you know, you'd have, like, the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. And, you know, here's Paul McCartney playing a left-handed tuba, right, because he's left-handed, and he's playing the bass tuba rather than the um, sousaphone. And Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock setting fire to his tuba. And the Ramones with their dented, rusted tubas at CBGBs. And then, you know, the rooftop concert with Bono and the Edge and their group U-Tuba. That would have been the history of rock. There are a number of misconceptions when it comes to the brain and music, and we'd like to clear a few of them up. First, you do not use only 10% of your brain. The truth is that most people are using most of their brain most of the time. The false idea was derived from groundbreaking but now dated research done in the 1930s by Wilder Penfield. Dr. Penfield, I can smell burnt toast. Yep, that guy. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Another misconception has to do with tone deafness. Imagine Bob Dylan, you know, as a third grader, you know, trying to sing along with the class. I mean, he doesn't have a classically euphonious voice. The thing is, Bob's right on pitch. If you analyze what he's doing, he actually hits the pitches square on. It's just that his voice doesn't have that kind of tonal center like Perry Como's voice or something. Very few of us are actually tone deaf. Uh, what I think happens is that there are a lot of different ways in which people singing can go awry and we lump them all together in this one category. Finally, you shouldn't be afraid to dance or sing. It's only natural. Western society in the last few hundred years has created this artificial distinction. There are the Ella Fitzgeralds, the Paul McCartneys, the Yo-Yo Ma's, and the rest of us pay money to hear them, and we're supposed to be very quiet and very still, uh, except maybe at a, you know, at a James Brown concert or something where you were allowed to move. Hey! Throughout most of our evolutionary history, tens of thousands of years, music and dance were the same thing. Music was a participatory experience. Everybody sang and danced. Everybody did it all at the same time. Now, it's not the case that there were never some people who were better than others, but the idea that we would develop a sort of class of experts and the rest of us shouldn't sing in public or play an instrument in public, that's a foreign concept and a very new one. And uh, I think it robs us of part of our humanity, part of our evolutionary heritage, which is that we were intended by evolution, you know, intended, we were meant to be making music, all of us. Thank you.